through an algorithm or some sort of um, uh, decision-making process, and then it gives us individualized information about where we are, what we're seeing, who we're with. And you also connect that to our social media presence, and now that gets combined to our friends and where they are, too. It becomes more powerful. So I've been thinking about this in the concepts of learning potential, and I see some dangers in it as well. I already hinted on the fact that there is a, uh, a loss in the concentration on the content due to, con to cognitive overload because of this. This is a, a new perception, a new way of uh, viewing the world. You're putting digital contents on top of real objects, which normally those two things are separated. And this can distract from the actual contents that you're uh, trying to convey. Now, this is also kind of outsourcing our brain and how we think, right? People with mobile phones and smartphones don't remember phone numbers as much as people that don't wear them, uh, don't use them. Uh, people that use smartphones and navigation devices need sometimes find them as a crutch and can't get home without them. Um, I personally can't call my wife without my phone because I don't have the phone number in my brain because I use my phone too much. This is all going to get exacerbated with this technology. So, for example, we have a, a device that looks at your face and it'll tell you who that person is. Does that mean in the future you'll remember people's names a little less? Well, some of us are already terrible with that, right? <laughs> so, there's an evolution with this as far as the technology and as it goes by. So, we saw we, when we gather data, the most simplest form that we've been using so far is your physical location, and, and that usually comes in the form of your GPS location, a set of coordinates on the Earth. And we saw some of that happen with tourism with something called geocaching. Um, about 20, 30 years ago it started. Basically, before cell phones, and you can carry around these large GPS locators to tell you where you are in the world, and it was almost like a treasure hunt, right? You, you have a set of coordinates, they're usually very nature oriented. You go out and find some place and discover a lockbox. Sometimes you have to, there's kind of a take an item, leave an item sense, and it was like a treasure trove of everyone that's been there before you. Um, mobile devices kind of upped that game into location based marketing tools, um, Foursquare, and now all the, uh, being able to check into a location to share that information out to all these other people. And now that you've checked in, the, the internet, <laughs> it just, it, for better or for worse, knows where you are. It can send you information based on that set of locations, and your friends might know where you are. And uh, that has turned into bigger amounts of data that can be aggregated and tell where foot tra traffic is and where you might businesses might be better off putting their uh, locations. And this came a bigger thing with game-based location stuff with Ingress and Pokemon Go. Anyone play Pokemon Go? Everyone kind of knows that the AR game because of this, because uh, it was such a sensation. The intellectual property of this was so big, a lot, they made so much money, and they make it on the front end selling in, in, uh, game items, but they make it on the back end selling where everyone's going and as far as aggregated data is going too. But where we're moving with this is that was all basically based on your location. Now we're going to start taking in more data based on other devices and other sensors already in our phone, like your, G, uh, your camera. Your cameras are going to start getting dual vision so they can sense depth. Thank you. And that's all moving towards, this is just an example that just came out last week. This is someone walking down Central Park up here in the corner. And what he sees through his lens, it's tracking the environment around him, a company called SLAM, Simultaneous Localization Mapping. The computer knows where he is physically, and it's putting digital contents in front of him. So he's actually inside the real world. You can see people walking around in the physical environment around him. But there's also these digital contents around him as well. So you can notice when you're walking down the street for a tourism setting, or you want to find an ATM or whatever, you, they pop up digitally in as far as distance and where to go. Um, and it's also at work, this, we're working with this with World Heritage Site as well as with data and things like that. Now, trying to come up with a theory about how best to design some good environments based on this technology, I kind of pulled from a couple of different ones. Uh, you need some technology-based theories, some that represent stakeholders and how they work together. This one is something for commu effective communication, motivation, opportunity, and ability, and that kind of tells you how well the, com the consumer is going to take in and accept this new technology, especially first-time users. 
Uh, we use this at TEDx Kyoto, and this is a good step to show the motivation of this project, um, this technology, right? So what we did is we had uh, these booths, and we kind of scaffolded, that's our TEDx Kyoto team, we scaffolded the technical skill at the level of technical buy-in for first-time users. We had a low-tech, medium-tech, and a high-tech option. Low-tech would be kind of a pen and paper, medium-tech show a piece of paper to an AR and have screen, and play around with it, take screenshots, and high-tech is download something on your smartphone and configure it and explore the area yourself. And this kind of helps show us the buy-in of what people are willing to do and how far they're willing to take the technology. And this really goes perfectly with the diffusion of innovation technology uh, theory. You know, you have your early adopters and your laggards and things like that. It goes almost perfectly with that thing. Opportunity. So when we're talking about tourism, um, what's the opportunity for people to use this technology? So this means ubiquitous computing. <laughs> so you need to have a strong, this, is, um, this technology takes a lot of bandwidth. So it's taking in camera data, taking in your personal location, it's sending that out to get uh, analyzed somewhere, probably on a server somewhere, and then it's sending in video data and things like that. So that takes a lot of bandwidth and therefore you need high speed internet. The ability, so are you, we do this with a group of 200 people every year in our city in Fukushima, and every year they get better at using this technology because they're aware of it, and how well they're able to use their smartphone and their ability to utilize it is very important. Three questions for using it. So using from those three points, motivation, opportunity, technology, do you have an infrastructure? Do you have the ubiquitous computing? Do people have the uh, devices? This is still very CPU intensive stuff, right? And are the users motivated and able, uh, able to try? Do they have the bandwidth? And uh, does that digital content actually add value? I'm gonna skip this because I'm running out of time. Uh, looking to the future, we're gonna start taking these phones out of our pockets and start putting these things on your face. I've tried a lot of these, what's called heads, head mounted displays. Um, there's still a lot of privacy and social issues involved with the acceptance of this, this type of always on technology that's always taking in data. What happens when you walk into a restroom wearing these devices, or um, especially in that, or what I worry about a lot in education is having students put these on and putting them at potential risk. That was quite fast, <laughs> uh, but you can, I, I have all the stuff that I mentioned, all the case studies that I pointed to and hinted to are all online. Mm -hmm. I have probably a good two dozen YouTube videos online where you can find case uses of particular applications of this technology. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank you. All right. Any questions from you? Oh, do we have time for questions? I think. Uh, we have three minutes left for the questions. Okay. I have a question or comment. Uh, I think uh, the applications would be important for heritage places because mm -hmm. in heritage, uh, so we have uh, those who take care of the properties. They are tasked to protect, it, not allow the visitors to, to come inside. But usually they do not have resources to bring resources to tourism, but it will deteriorate the place. And I think there are great opportunities for. There's already a, tons of case uses with this technology. Anywhere where you want to go, where you want to protect. An environment, or it's too dangerous to go into that environment. Yeah. This is very useful. Um, they just 